Eternal God, you draw near to us in Christ and make yourself our guest. Amid the cares of our lives, make us attentive to your presence, that we may treasure your word above all else. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Congregation, please be seated. I'd like to invite the children to come on up for the children. So I'm so glad you came up because when I walked into church today, Jesse, it's like, are you growing plants in here? It looks a little different. Did you notice anything different around the no. altar today? Yeah. Did you notice anything? Mm-hmm. What did you notice? What do you see? Did you notice, <laughs> did you notice real colorful pool noodles? Pretty amazing. And I think they're like coral reef. And behind us, there's a big silver anchor. Yes! And you would have an anchor on a plane. So all of these decorations are, why are they here? We have UBS this week, so there are lots of things here. And they're displayed with all these colorful ocean fish. VBS. Um, very, very summer? Not quite. No, what's VBS? Vacation Bible School. Oh, Vacation Bible School. Oh, that's what, that's right, so we had kids that came and learned about Jesus. <laughs> now, one of the first things we learned about was creation. We learned about everything that God made. And, and what are some of the things that you see that God made? Shark week too. You know that? <laughs> Shark week's coming up. Uh, what other creatures were in the sea? Dolphins. Dolphins? You think God made dolphins? Yeah. Hey, come on over here. Come on over here. Do you think, do you think God made Stingray. which kind? Goldfish? Did God make goldfish? Yeah. That's Stingray. so Stingrays? Wow. What's the Do you know the Bible tells us? Well, I bet you Jesse knows. Every time God made something, God said, eh. No. <laughs> no? He said, it is good. What? Yes, everything he made. He looked at it, and then he said, that is good. That's so awesome. So how about this? What if we say, it is good, after I name an animal? Can we do that? Can we say, it is good? Are you ready? So, ducks. It is good. Platypuses. Octopuses. It's actually octopi. (laughs) How about um, orcas? It is good. What about sea urchins? It is good. What about jellyfish? It is good. And what about each and every one of us? It is good. And that's one of the things we learned that. Vacation Bible School, that God created everything, and that includes you. Can you you go and get some prayer? Yes, do you guys want to pray with me? Okay. Dear God. Dear God. Thank you for all the things you made. Thank you for all the things you made. We love the world. We love the animals you put in it. We love the animals you put in it. We are so excited. We are so excited.
under the tree. Let me bring a little bread that you may refresh yourselves, and after that you may pass on, since you've come to your servant. So they said, do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, make ready quickly three measures of choice flour, knead it and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf tender and good, and gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that had been prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, where is your wife Sarah? And he said, there in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife Sarah shall have a son. The word of God, the word of life. Now, i got to add a commentary. Do you know how old Abraham was? 99 years old. Sarah, 85. And as you just did, guess what Sarah's reaction is as she's listening through the tent? She's going to laugh. Is anything impossible with God? Our gospel acclamation, please rise if you're able.
Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 10th chapter, verse 38 to 42. Now, as Jesus and his disciples went on their way, he entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks, so she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from. The Word of God, the Word of life. You may be seated. Uh, It's kind of interesting, uh, this little uh, story. It's pretty short. I've only preached on it a couple times. You know, I've been a pastor for 30 years, over 30 years. I've only preached on it a couple times. And the reason why I usually don't preach on it, I usually go to the, you know, one of the other lessons, is because, uh, quite frankly, uh, there's something for everyone to hate in the story of Martha and Mary. There's something here for everybody to get angry at, not to like. I mean, the story has a history of being somewhat divisive, misunderstood, used as a way to justify all kinds of things, and usually at the expense of those who see the world differently. I mean, it's such a simple story. But it carries so much baggage to it that it's a bit difficult to unpack. Because after all, there are two kinds of people in the world. Those who divide the world into two kinds of people and those who don't. And this story has been used by the church throughout the ages to kind of suggest that Jesus is lifting up one action over against the other. One sister over against the other. And no matter how you slice it, there are folks who hear this story and are going to feel hurt, surprised, or a little offended at what they imagine or have heard preached or read about what is going on. You know, perhaps it's a legacy of sexism in the church that seems to pit these two sisters against each other. I have to ask myself, if it were two brothers, would we ever suggest that the story is speaking about men's roles in the church? Or would we just see two different personalities? But maybe it's because we have so few stories about two women that the story's been almost looked at unfairly. Well, for whatever reason, A lot of sermons, a lot of books, a lot of devotionals have locked on to this dichotomy between the two of them and set up a kind of rivalry or or a universal maxim about one behavior is better than another. And I want to suggest to you today that this might not be helpful and probably not at the heart of the story at all. You know, we talked a little bit on Wednesday about art, and I had someone ask if we do some art today. So we do some art today. Why not? So um, this is one of my favorite stories, setting up this dichotomy, right? So this, is, this painting is great on a lot of levels. Uh, it's by Campy. It's the mid-1500s. Um, so here, uh, guess who this is? This is Martha or Mary? Come on, folks. That's Martha. And look how distracted she is by many things. Now what's really funny about this story, a couple things. One, here's a uh, pig that's hanging and here's a lobster, which probably would not be on the Jewish dinner table in Jesus' day, but it's the mid-1500s, so we'll just let them go with it, right? But we got her, her she's holding up a big uh, filet of salmon here, and she's got, a, she's got a, a basket, and there's all kinds of critters, all things to cook, and all this stuff, right? And then through the little window... Kind of like he's sitting at a little uh, bistro. (laughs) There's Jesus. And who's sitting next to Jesus? 
Mary, there they are, just having this quiet little chat, right? While Martha's left to do everything, right? So it's just a great painting, and, and it kind of expresses how a lot of folks have kind of heard this story read through the ages. This one's pretty good, too. Um, you know, here's uh, Martha. This is great. She's got a goose. You know, I never knew this until I got to Iowa, how you dispatched a chicken. But I've, uh, I've, learned, I've learned about that since I've been to Iowa. And uh, she's got a goose here. It looks like that she's just dispatched. And she's got all kinds of stuff on the table and ready to go. And, and uh, you know, I think this is her tending the fire, right? And the guests. And, and, and here's, this is Martha. And this must be Mary. And this is a very studious picture, isn't it? She's got a book in front of her, right? And Jesus has got a little traveling library right here, which is kind of fun. If you're a dog lover, this is great, right? Medieval painters often will put a dog in there. Uh, medieval people were very smart. They hardly ever put a cat in their picture. <laughs> oh, Roger, Mary, Joe, wherever you are, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just teasing. But again, this distraction, right, and all of this stuff. Now, this next painting is my favorite. It's my favorite. Um, Velasquez. Um, Here's Martha, and look at her expression, right? And here's, that's Martha, this must be, and again, you know, it's kind of, part of it's the style of the art, but Martha is against a very dark background. And here there's not an abundance of food, right? It's very simple, but here she is trying to make something out of you know, some fish, it looks like some garlic, and maybe a couple eggs, right? But what I love about this painting, and I don't know this, but of course, this is Martha, here's Mary, and here's the kind of the light, but there's these figures behind, and I don't know this, this is just my guess, but my guess is, this is, she's a woman, I know it's maybe hard to tell, but she's a woman, and I wonder if this is not someone in, in Martha's past, that's pointing at her and saying, you better, you should, you must, you have to. You ever have that voice in your head, right, that kind of sets up expectations? And I wonder if that's not exactly what this is. And we have someone over here with Mary, too, who's very different. And, you know, maybe it's Martha coming in, but I don't know. I wonder if that's someone in her past, some voice in her past that says, here, this is what's important. This is what you can do. And the idea that all of us have these different uh, kind of expectations that we bring to anything in life. Well, I don't know if art's helpful for you, but sometimes for me, it's one of the first ways that I begin to get into a Bible story. I, I like to see what, what people have, how they've depicted it, and see if that kind of spurs my imagination a little bit. But the first thing that comes to me, and I think this is really important. Let's be clear. Both behaviors are good and admirable. Both behaviors are good and admirable. Let's start with Martha and her attention to hospitality. She is keeping with the very best traditions of her day. In fact, the Old Testament lesson, right, about Abraham providing hospitality uh, and that's exactly what Martha is doing. We would never suggest that Abraham was wrong for showing hospitality to those three on the road, right? And so certainly Martha is not wrong. She's on target. And let's face it, Jesus was not John the baptizer. He didn't go around eating locusts and honey. But he ate at people's homes and sometimes fancy homes and seems to have enjoyed these things in life. Amen? Amen? Whenever you go to someone's house, they invite you over, and they have this wonderful uh, uh, feast on the table for you. Do you ever go, oh, I wish, really wish you wouldn't have? No. You dig right into those ribeyes, don't you, Dave? You just dig right in, and you enjoy every morsel. I guarantee you, Jesus was not upset with hospitality. Jesus was not upset with hospitality. In the words of another famous Martha, it's a good thing. Do you know that, that reference? Went over your heads? Martha Stewart. <laughs> yeah. 
In fact, the word used to describe Martha's actions is actually the root word for deacon or, or deaconate, which is a long-cherished position in the church, one who serves. Mary, too, has made a good move. It's a bold move. She's decided to sit at Jesus' feet. This, in Jesus' day, would have usually been a place for men. But she's going to take the opportunity to listen, to be a part of the conversations that, God, that Jesus brings. This is good and positive. The point is not that serving, doing, is inferior to study or learning or devotion. There's not a winner and a loser in this story. That, again, is part of the baggage that we bring. We always want to know who's been naughty and who's been nice. We kind of live in a zero-sum world where we always want to know which was right and which was wrong. And actually, both behaviors are good and admirable. But, of course, it's that conversation between Martha and Jesus that seems to give a, a pleasant story a nasty little turn. Martha comes up and says, don't you care, Jesus, that I'm doing all this work? Tell my sibling to help me. Don't you care? You know, this reminded me of the time when Jesus was in the boat on the lake. And the storm came up. And the disciples roused him from his sleep. That story's in Mark 4. Remember that story? Where they're on the, in the boat and there's a big storm and, and, and the boat's about to capsize and Jesus is in the back <laughs> asleep. And they rouse him. Do you remember what the disciples say? They go, Jesus, don't you care that we are about to perish? Do you not care? And the more I thought about this, it's a strange move by Martha. For someone who obviously knows about showing hospitality, she puts Jesus as the guest of honor in a tricky spot, kind of involves him in a family matter. It, it's awkward. And the more I thought about this, the more I began to think that perhaps this is the reason why Luke gives us this story. You know, this little dialogue where Martha was distracted by her many tasks till she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care? My sister has left me to do all the work by myself. Tell her then to help me. And I wonder if Martha's question is really the underlying question. Do you not care? And I think that's a question that all of us as people of faith want to ask. And maybe we have asked God. Do you not care? And this is the lament of everyone who has had a broken heart. Everyone who has suffered tragedy. Everyone who has wondered if they matter in this world. If they are important. If they have even been noticed or made a difference. Lord, do you not care? The more I read and study uh, this parable, I think this is the operative part. Martha isn't so much worried about who's doing what as she is overwhelmed with the feeling that most of us have had. Does anyone, does even God, care? And Jesus' response is to that question, not to the actions. He's not responding to her serving, to her hospitality, to her good hard work. That's all wonderful. He's responding to the question, don't you care? The stuff about, you know, tell my sibling to help me, that's a throwaway. That's not really what Martha is concerned about. She's got to be used to her sister, right? She knows her sister's personality. She probably wouldn't expect her to, to be anywhere else. 
right? How many of you know your siblings' personalities? Are you surprised after 30, 40, 50 years of how they act? Don't you just kind of go, ah, oh, yeah. No, I think the, Mar the, the issue with Martha, I don't think the issue is her sister. I don't think the issue is her service, not her hospitality, not her hard work. I think the issue is her insecurity. I think it's her insecurity. And insecurity is not limited to women. <laughs> but we men are riddled with it as well. And the more I reflect on this story, I don't think her plea is to get her sibling to help, but to know whether or not Jesus has noticed. Noticed her. Cares about her. Recognizes her. Lord, do you not care? And this is beautiful because Jesus' words then are not rebuke. They're not shaming or disparaging. They are an invitation. Martha. Martha. You're worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. And that one thing is not to get your sister to help. Let's focus on your question. The one thing needed is for Martha to receive the gracious presence of Jesus, to listen to his words, to know that she is valued, not for what she does or how well she does it, but for who she is as a child of God. Martha needs to have her question answered. Lord, don't you care? And the answer is yes. I do care. I do see I care just as I care for your sister, not because of what you do, but because you are marvelously made and a child of God. That's the only thing that is necessary to know that I care, that God cares and loves us. And the story then becomes timeless for us as well, for all of us whose hectic, busy lives, all of us distracted by so many things, especially in our digital world, when we can know instantly if a flea bites the hindquarters of a dog clear across the world within seconds, when it seems like everything that can go wrong does go wrong, when it seems like there are more worries than I can keep up with, when we cry out like Martha, like the disciples in the boat, Lord, don't you care? We're given an invitation to come to his side and hear the promise of his word and the calling of his voice. Martha. Martha. Yes. I hear you. And yes, I care. This is the one thing that is needed. And you mustn't let the distractions of life ever take this away. Yes. God cares. When I talk with uh, folks about baptism, one of the things we talk about is, you know, why do we baptize, right? And there's all kinds of things out there in the Bible, there's all kinds of stuff, but you know the reason why we baptize, right? The only, there's only one reason, really, that we baptize. It's because Jesus commanded it. Matthew 28. That's really the reason, right? Jesus commanded us to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And as I talk to, to parents especially, I kind of say, why do you think, if, if Jesus is who we say he is, God with us, does God need anything from us? Does God need anything from us? Does God need us to baptize? No, God doesn't need anything. If God is who we say God is, amen? That's the nature of being God. Are you with me? Right? But yet Jesus being God with us, Jesus commanded it. So if God doesn't need it, it must be that Jesus felt that we needed it. And then the question becomes, why did Jesus think that we needed it? And the, one of the reasons that I talk about with, with moms and dads and, and folks that are going to be baptized is because I think there's a reality in our world that people want to give us all kinds of, of things that we're supposed to define ourselves by, right? You are where you live. You are what kind of car you drive. You are who your friends are. You are how good you are at school. You are how fast you are as an athlete. 
you are, how wonderful you are as an artist, right? We live in a world that wants to define us by what we do and how we do it. And in the waters of baptism, we are promised that our value comes to us simply because we are loved, forgiven children of God. And that becomes terra firma. You see, I am duped into thinking that all these other things are terra firma, right? The ground, the hard ground that I can put my life on. Oh my goodness, I'm so good at. And here's a reality we don't like to think about. Almost any of those things can be taken away from us in an instant. And the one thing that can never be taken away is that you are a baptized, loved child of that, to me, is why Jesus commanded us to be baptized. So we might always know who we are. Don't you care? Yes. I don't care for you because of your service record. I don't care for you because of your GPA. I don't care of you because of your success. All those things are wonderful. But that's not why God cares. God cares because God is love. Because you are baptized, forgiven, child of God. I think for me the story of Martha and Mary is simply as she's distracted by the many things. I think she's distracted by her feeling that she's going to be judged. That she's somehow going to have worth by how she does what she is doing and whether it's good enough. Ever wrestle with that demon? And here Jesus, I think, is saying there's need of only one thing. (laughs) To know that you're loved. Simply for who you are. Or if you want, you can think about it this way. Life is not a zero-sum game. Life is not a zero-sum game where there has to be winners and losers. We can't begrudge others who have different callings, different gifts, different understandings. You don't want me to sing in the choir. (laughs) You really don't. I know people always say, oh, pastor, yeah. Really, bless you, but for the love of God, no. And I shouldn't be begrudged that you sing in the choir, and you shouldn't be begrudged that I don't, right? Because we simply have different gifts. And we are not loved in accordance to whether or not we can hit a perfect pitch. We are loved simply because we are baptized, loved, forgiven, children of Life is not a zero-sum game. It's not about winners and losers. Not in the world of faith. All we can do is go about our lives remembering the one essential thing. There's only one thing. That God does care about us. That God notices us. That God loves us. That we each live out our life and serve God as we are able. That God cares about us, but not exclusively about us. Right? We can allow Mary to be Mary and Martha to be Martha. As long as we hold on to the one truth that binds all of us together, and that is, don't you care? And the answer is, yes. And you're loved. And your worth has nothing to do with what you are doing. Now go and do it (laughs) as best as you can. Realizing that God loves you no more or no less, but simply delights when you are able to do those things that you naturally have been given. I don't think This story is really trying to tell us that one sister is above another. And I don't think Martha was surprised at all about Mary. I'm assuming they got to be at least 30 years old, right? I think she knows full well about her sister. No, I think it's really that first question that started it all off. And it's a question that we've heard before. And it's a question that we need to hear answered. 
Yes. God cares. Amen. I'm going to invite you, if you're able, please rise. We sing together our hymn of the day. Let's pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. But first, let us say the Apostles' Creed. With the whole church, let us confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended to heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Dear Lord, we come before you and we pray for our world. We thank you, dear Lord, that you have given us a promise in baptism that we are loved, that we are forgiven, that we are indeed children of yours. Help us not to be so concerned about others that we might simply see the gift you have given us to be ourselves and to love the world even as you've loved us. Lord, in your mercy. Dear Lord, we do pray for our world. We know that there are anxious times all around the globe. We know that uh, we live in a time where their people can't say a single word without others taking it up as a great offense. We realize that we are anxious. Dear Lord, we pray that we might give all of those anxieties to you, that you might restore in us a right spirit that we might see in each other neighbor. Dear Lord, we pray for the leaders of our world. Dear Lord, we pray for, for those that uh, we agree with wholeheartedly and even those that we don't. We pray that somehow peace might come through. We pray, dear Lord, that you might be at work to help us, dear Lord, as a church to let our light shine. For those who are suffering through war, injustice, for those who are suffering because of oppression, for those who are suffering because of, of who they are, dear Lord, we simply pray that they may be safe and that peace may come. Lord, in your mercy. 
Dear Lord, we pray for our own nation. We pray for our own leaders. Dear Lord, we're bold to pray for leaders on every side of every issue. We thank you for the gifts that you've given us. And we pray, dear Lord, that you might help us to be stewards of these gifts. Not only stewards of, of, the, of creation, but stewards of community. Help us, dear Lord, to not be pulled into pettiness. But help us, dear Lord, to let our light shine even when we talk about things of the secular world. Lord, in your mercy. Dear Lord, we thank you for good friends. We thank you for family. We thank you for good food and drink. We thank you for all of those who provide hospitality. We are told in Hebrews that some have entertained even angels as they have shown hospitality. Help us, dear Lord, never to tire of being good to one another. Dear Lord, we pray for those who are sick. We pray for those who are dying. We pray for those who are caregivers. We pray, dear Lord, for those who are battling with uh, addictions, with all kinds of afflictions. We pray for those who love them. Dear Lord, we pray for those who have un had uneasy weeks and feel disoriented. And dear Lord, we pray for those who have had some of the best weeks of their lives and are filled with joy. May we always, no matter where we find ourselves, always come back to you in prayer, in praise, in thanksgiving. Lord, in your mercy. Now, dear Lord, hear the prayers we give you, out loud or in the silence of our hearts. Lord, in your mercy. In your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And you. I invite you to turn around, and we have folks that are watching online. And uh, for everybody that's online watching, you as well are part of this congregation. Let's give on the count of three a big peace of the Lord. One, two, three. Peace, peace of the Lord. Lord. If you're online, you can text or email that piece around. And here in the sanctuary, as you are comfortable, I invite you to share the piece. Congregation, please be seated. I'd like to always uh, just take a moment to say thank you for all of the offerings and the gifts that you present. Certainly the gifts that come in the offering plate and the online uh, giving. For those of you who are online, thank you. Those gifts come and they're so appreciated. It, it's what it takes to do ministry. And we don't ever apologize for that. That's simply, you know, to, to be in ministry takes those funds. So thank you. And this is one of the things that God calls us to, is that is to be generous, right? And generous not only just with our, our monies, thank you, but also generous with our time and our abilities. And we sometimes in the church get so fixated on one of those things that we forget that every breath we take has the potential to be an offering given to God. Think about that. Every breath you take has the potential to be an offering given to God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for my family. Thank you for my friends. Thank you for your love. Every breath is an opportunity to bless the world. And so you do that in a thousand different ways. Thank you. One of the things that I love about our tradition in the Lutheran church, we're never going to apologize for being Lutheran, right? We know that we are Christian, and, and we are Christians who celebrate and live out our faith within this lens of being Lutheran. And one of the things that, that Luther did in his catechism, the Eighth Commandment, you shall not bear false witness, right? He said in the explanation, we should explain our neighbor's actions, do you remember this? In the kindest of ways. 
to explain our neighbor's actions in the kindest of ways. And as we live into that, that's an offering. It's an offering that we can give in a world that certainly does not hold on to the Eighth Commandment as anything important and certainly is not committed to explaining its neighbor's actions in the kindest of ways. And yet we as a body of Christ gathered can say, we are. We're not perfect and we don't always do that. But we know that it's what we're called to be. And those little things, my point, are a precious offering. So thank you as you bring that to your Lord each and every day. We are a church of word and sacrament, so we understand that Christ is present as the word is proclaimed, uh, read, that Christ is present in the bread, in the cup. But Jesus is here, fully and truly. So we're going to commune today with those little cups that you received when you came in. If you didn't get one, put your hand in the air. We'll run one over to you. Um, does anybody need one? Just put your hand up high in the air so people know. And if you want to go back and get one yourself, you can do that. You might want to open it up now. Uh, it can be a little tricky. The top one is the wafer. The bottom, more substantial, is the juice. Um, and be careful with that when you open it. It can kind of bounce out a little bit. We'll commune together after we say the Lord's Prayer. This is not magic. For you at home, Christ is present. Christ is with you. If you have elements you want to join with us, that's fine. But you don't have to because the promise is that Christ is with us. And here as we commune, whether it's with a loaf of bread or that wafer, this is a holy moment. Because Christ is with us. As surely as you hold that wafer, as surely as you taste that cup, Christ is here. In the night in which he's betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is a new covenant, the new promise in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering his promise to be truly present in bread and cup as two or more gather in his name. Remember the prayer that he taught us, even as we say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is kingdom, power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As you take that wafer, this is the body of Christ given for you. Take the cup. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. Now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen you, keep you in God's grace now for life everlasting. Amen. Welcome to everybody, and again, we hope and trust and pray that you've heard the good news of God this day. Go out and be God's people in the world. You are loved. You are the children of God. You are enough, right? And so go and be the person that God's called you to be. Don't have to worry about other folks. Just be who God's called you to be, and God will bless that and is pleased in that. A couple of quick announcements. We are um, doing lots of things. The 
the Fly Juice Box Drive is going on. Thank you for all of that. For those that are helping with Fly on Mondays, we still have some openings, uh, some new openings as well. And so if you can come on Monday to help with that, go to our website, look online. Um, for VBS, thank you. you know, the decorations are beautiful. It was fun. We had you know, student helpers and we had adult helpers and, and folks that came and, and folks that don't usually come to church were here. And it's just that's what we want to do. So thank you for everybody. Um, Marion Cares Backpack Program. So that's coming up. So we've done this a couple years, but, and I just got, you know, you see a backpack. It gets a name in it. And here's the thing. Um, these things are expensive. Um, they really are. This school, like, have everything in here for your school supplies, that's well over 100 bucks. I mean, well over 100 bucks. I think uh, my wife went out, and I think, you know, it's, you know, it's well over $100 to have everything in there. And we realized that you can't, all of us can't do that. That's okay. Um, but if you want to participate... You certainly can put together the backpack, the information's there, or you can just give a, a whatever donation you'd like, and then we buy the supplies and the backpacks, and we fill them up. So it's kind of a nice thing, right? So if maybe you've got, you know, $5 that you want on the scratcher, well, you know the Lord's calling you to give that to the church, and um, now if you want a million dollars on the scratcher, the Lord's calling you to come talk to me <laughs> after, after worship, but... Um, but it's a way just to kind of, you know, to help out a little bit. So if you want to do that, great. And if you don't, that's okay. Don't forget, we're never going to get tired of putting things in front of you. We're never going to get tired of giving you opportunities that you can bless the world as long as you realize there's no guilt or obligation. Um, these are just opportunities. And so that's how we have to work together, right? Because otherwise you're going to start feeling resentful. And that's not what God wants, and that's not to the glory of God. We just want to have opportunities, and if you want to jump in on them, great. And if you don't, it's okay. In fact, I think maybe sometime next month we'll have one of these, and I'll make a statement saying, I'm not going to support this financially. That's supposed to be funny. Come on. <laughs> um, but you know what I'm saying, right? It's okay. It's okay. Um, neighborhood nights, we're coming up uh, our, our neighborhood night in July. We're going to ask folks to help bring the soft drinks. So there's a sign-up genius. If you can help the soft drinks uh, bring those in, that's great. We get, you know, 250 kids, and it's hot and lots of you know, drinks go pretty quick. And so if you want to help us with that, that's great. Also with just the bounce housing and, you know, and all the stuff that happens, cleanup, set up. So many people work so hard on that, and thank you. We'd love to get more people involved in that. Uh, on that same day is our uh, second annual car show. And so uh, it'll be a full day here at LCR, and uh, we hope that you can come and be a part of those things. The Summer Sundays tables out there. Don't forget, for uh, Sunday school age kids, there's a table out there with activities. Always uh, a nice opportunity. You can look at uh, where our um, mission envelopes are going, to the food pantry, all those other things on the yellow sheet that you received right here when you came in, and it has all the information on there. I would like to simply say to all of our visitors, thank you for being with us. God bless you. You're always welcome here. You're always welcome at the table um, to commune with us, and uh, whether you're a, a worshiper here or whether you're online, we sure would love to get connected. Uh, if you're here, there's some bags out there filled with LCR propaganda and flashlights and all kinds of stuff that you can take with you. But also online, if you want to connect with us, we'd love to uh, uh, nurture that relationship. Thank you so much for being the people of God. There's uh, hospitality out there, uh, and you can enjoy that and linger a little bit if you can. Uh, Bible study as well. Uh, and if you need to get on your way, know that you're loved and know that you're an important part of this ministry and an important part of what God's doing in the world. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, look upon you with favor, grant you peace. Amen. I'm going to invite you, if you're able, please rise. We sing our sending song, Oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing.
The worship is over.